Hello and welcome to the Sheen Center Online. I'm David Deserto, Interim Executive Director, and the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Center for Thought and Culture is the art center of the Archdiocese of New York. And today's conversation is part of our ongoing free public content uh, that we're offering while we can't gather together in person down at the Sheen Center. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please like us, subscribe to our uh, YouTube Sheen Talks channel, and go ahead and click that bell icon so you can be notified of future videos. Um, we also encourage you during these uh, challenging times, if you're able to consider making a donation to the Sheen Center, and we're happy to announce that from now through Thanksgiving, uh, part of our donations uh, will be contributed to the uh, food banks of Catholic Charities. Now, as many of you know, uh, we've been honored to be able to host a virtual two-week run of the remarkable new documentary, Flannery, which explores the life and legacy of the iconic Southern Catholic writer, Flannery O'Connor. Uh, I assume you've either watched the movie already uh, or plan on watching the movie. But if you haven't, it will be available on our Sheen Center uh, website. That's sheencenter.org. And uh, it will be available from now uh, through October 15th. So again, if you haven't seen it, really encourage you to watch it. Uh, it's a, a terrific documentary. Um, so before we go ahead and introduce today's special guests, why don't we take a look at the trailer? One critic called her perhaps the most naturally gifted of American novelists, Flannery O'Connor. A good man is hard to find. Wise blood, mystery and manners. Everything that rises must convict you. She's one of the best writers of the 20th century. I've read everything that she's written. Flannery O'Connor is one of the writers least afraid to look at the darkness. We've had an accident, the children screamed in a frenzy of delight. But nobody's killed, June Starr said, with disappointment. You think it's this bitter old alcoholic who's writing these really funny, dark stories. And then you find out she's a woman and that she's devoutly religious. Flannery O'Connor was born in Savannah, Georgia, into an Irish Catholic community. You get someone who's writing out of a specific time, specific set of manners. What she found was mystery. I think that a serious fiction writer describes an action only in order to reveal a mystery. How is she going to find the stories that she knows she needs to tell? And how is she going to tell them? I do not want to be lonely all my life, but people only make us lonelier by reminding us of God. It's unbelievable. She was so sick. She never stopped writing. It was the illness that made her the writer that she is. I feel that the grotesque quality of my own work is intensified by the fact that I'm a Southern and a Catholic writer. She's really funny. She's often funny in a very dire way. She ignored the disapproval of her religion. She ignored the disapproval of her fiction. She just saw the mystery of the craziness. Well, we are doubly blessed today to have the two co-creators of this film, uh, co-directors, Elizabeth Kaufman and Father Mark Bosco. And before I invite them on to uh, join us, let me tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Elizabeth has produced and directed films about communities in crisis from Louisiana to Bosnia. Uh, and like with this documentary, many, many of her other films include or are about writers such as One More Mile with writer Alexander Heman, uh, Veins in the Gulf with Martha Serpus, and Souls and Sonnets with Rita Dove. Uh, Father uh, Mark Bosco SJ is a Jesuit priest and a professor. He is an authority on the works of Flannery O'Connor and Graham Greene. Uh, his most recent book is Graham Greene's Catholic Imagination, published by Oxford University Press. He is the vice president for mission and ministry at Georgetown University, uh, and Flattery is his first film project. Welcome, Elizabeth and Father Mark. Thanks nice to be with you. Oh, no, we're so, uh, so excited to talk with you. Um, I absolutely love this film, uh, partly because I am, you know, among, like those people in the uh, trailer, a longtime fan of Flannery O'Connor. 
Uh, and uh, I've got a lot to unpack here. But before we do, first of all, just congratulations. I mean, the, the first Library of Congress Ken Burns Award, that's, that's pretty impressive. So congratulations on that. And uh, before we jump into a lot of the stuff that we can unpack about Flannery, the writer, the crafts, um, and all those things, let's just ask a simple question, and I offer it really to the both of you. Uh, what drew you to Flannery O'Connor, and what really made you feel compelled uh, to make this documentary about her? So maybe Elizabeth, start with you first. Sure. Well, I grew up in the South and I grew up wanting to be a writer. I, I was not traumatized is too strong a word, but I was a little horrified at the history of the South following the Civil War, at the segregation that uh, still exists. And uh, I found in literature a way to think through uh, these conflicts and yeah, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, just south of Savannah. So linking to uh, Flannery O'Connor was was natural for me. How about you, Father? Yeah, you know, well, um, I, I remember reading Flannery O'Connor for the first time in high school and being just so puzzled by her, feeling uh, even back then that something great was happening, but I couldn't get it. <laughs> I was just like, it was over the, it was overwhelming. And then of course I saw, I read her in college and, and as my work it more and more got into the Catholic literary tradition, um, I was drawn more and more to Flannery O'Connor to, to write about her. I was interested in how this, um, uh, this faithful, devout Catholic woman uh, was, was really kind of, um, creating a new kind of modernist form of, of, of writing that spoke both to her faith and to the people uh, in her own context and history. So I think for me, it was just a kind of a gradual kind of, I need to do more, I need to understand Flannery O'Connor, which really led me to, to love her. I'm teaching her right now at a seminar with a little over 20 Georgetown students. And it's just, it's a fantastic experience just to go through all these stories with these students, such a revelation. Excuse the pun. I mean, that's the perfect uh, way to say, it. yeah. Um, and we can certainly talk about uh, her, her, you know, the specific stories. Um, Elizabeth, you had studied uh, English literature in college, and uh, as we said in your bio, many of your films are either specifically about or at least somehow include conversations with authors. What is it about literary figures that intrigues you as a filmmaker? Well, I actually have a PhD from an English department and I, I started out thinking, oh, I have to focus on Faulkner. And, and then I went to graduate school and fell in love with film history and film studies. So I shifted and, and did a dissertation on film history uh, and then started to make films after that. So from the very beginning, all of my films that you referenced in the beginning have both writers in them and religious topics. I mean, the the environmental documentary I made, Veins in the Gulf, the, uh, the host is the poet Martha Surpass, who is a committed Catholic. Um, uh, the Bosnia film I made uh, after the Balkan crisis uh, features tensions between the Catholic heritage uh, and the Muslim population. Um, the 17th century Jewish poetry history of Saracopia Sulem uh, that has Rita Dove in it. Again, a tension between Catholicism and Judaism. So I don't, you know, it's something about writers who, the you know, writers are able to take that deeper, longer look that is so much about um, spiritual and moral interests that I never started out thinking, oh, this is going to have a religious topic and I'm going to have a writer figure centrally. Um, but I always wind up there because I think writers, um, for me anyway, address these world tensions uh, in a way that I identify with. Well, it is fascinating. And, you know, for a film that's about a writer, uh, it's also a very visual film. And hopefully we'll have time to just to get into the way that you crafted this film using 
uh, various animators, because I think that's such an important part of this particular film. Um, in one of the companion conversations that you recorded uh, in connection with this film, and I really encourage uh, anyone, whether they've seen the film yet or not, uh, they're available, I believe, on YouTube. And there's, there's, I know there's, at least I saw four of them. I'm not sure if there's more uh, that deal with different elements of, of Flannery O'Connor's legacy. But in one of them, uh, Elizabeth, you had talked about uh, similar to to father's experience, how you had first encountered Flannery O'Connor, Flannery O'Connor, um, uh, and and then you had I think the word you would use you would, you would put her aside for a while, but then you came back to her. What was it that made you come back to her? Well, it was Father Mark Bosco brought me back <laughs> <laughs> to Flannery O'Connor uh, because he um, initiated this project. He inherited. Um, Old, these great older interviews and then he was putting on a conference at Loyola Chicago where uh, he used to work and we were colleagues and he knew I was a documentary filmmaker and he's like hey want to help me make a documentary film <laughs> about Flannery O'Connor and so I you know documentary films are a lot of work so I didn't jump up and down I was like sure I love Flannery O'Connor uh, but then when I looked at these original films um, that Mark had, uh, you know, I, I knew pretty immediately, and Mark had that instinct too, that uh, he had some great original footage from Sally Fitzgerald and uh, Bob Theroux, other things. And, and that's what brought me along because I, I had an instinct that we could get an NEH grant, and we did, and that American Masters would be interested, and they were. And they were. <laughs> Yeah, well, yes, absolutely. Along with the animation, so much of the archival footage and photos that are in this film really creates such a, a, a visual backdrop, again, for such a literary subject. Um, you know, Father, you are um, an authority on Flannery O'Connor. Uh, one of my favorite uh, sort of little quips of Flannery, and she has so many, it's hard to pick favorites, but one of them is that she, she goes, I want to discover what I know. And I think she tried to discover uh, a lot in her writing. Um, for, for someone who knew already knew so much about Flannery O'Connor, having studied her and taught her and written about her over the years, did you discover something about her uh, through the experience of, of taking this journey, this filmmaking process? Well, you know, I guess I, all the things that I've heard, right, about from either from uh, from Billy Sessions or from another uh, Gene Cash, or all, and, and actually being able to kind of go and um, uh, investigate myself. So on, on two levels, I learned I learned about how deep her friendships were. I mean, I knew they were deep between the habit of being, you see it, but having going to actually visit Eric Lanker, uh in Denmark before he, he passed, uh, talking to him about his relationship with Flannery O'Connor, it, it just, it made it such a human experience. Um, it humanized Flannery O'Connor as well. Um, going through the archives and holding the uh, the 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 Lord's um, uh, bath ticket that she basically had, so that she could take the baths in the waters of of Lourdes. It was just it's like, oh my gosh, you know. I mean, I had just been in Lourdes myself, and here we go. And, I, and so it, it's like almost a sacramental kind of touching and and seeing things with your own eyes. That um, and so in some ways, it's kind of almost like a pilgrimage. I, I felt like I was the film was a pilgrimage into a, a deeper sense of who she was, uh, her importance. Um, gosh, her, her talent, uh, her wit, um, and finally just how deep her friendships are. I'm not sure if, if, if Flannery O'Connor was alive today, I'm not sure yeah, like, I'd be intimidated with by her, but having now seen how she, she was so loyal and so dedicated to friendship, um, it actually, uh, it was a, prof it's been a profound experience to see that. Wow. It, it must've been, uh. You know, just watching the trailer, you see that in addition to just the the rank and file devoted fans of her, you know, readers, uh, the, the scope of the people that she has uh, not only influenced, but made admirers. I mean, everyone from the world of academics, uh, folks like, you know, Dr. Cornell West to, you know, authors I, in, in one of the companion pieces. It was it was really so fascinating listening to some of the conversations with authors like um, uh, Richard Rodriguez and Alice Walker. Um, but even, you know, musicians like Bruce Springsteen has been very public about, you know, the impact Flannery's writings have had on his on his lyrics uh, and music. 
Um, and as we saw, you know, celebrities like Conan O'Brien and I know Stephen Colbert and, uh, and others, what is it or what do you think it was that uh, someone who, you know, described herself as a, as a hillbilly Thomist <laughs> was able to uh, speak through her craft and her very distinct voice with such diverse audiences? Yeah. Do uh, you want to take that, Elizabeth? Go ahead. I'll start. I know you're the hillbilly, hillbilly Thomas guy, but <laughs> in terms of... Um, her personality and her persona. I mean, I obsessed about a decade uh, reading everything that she'd written and her letters and, and really getting a sense of um, what she cared about. And this respect for her, you know, struggling with lupus and her health issues and her ability to, um, from a very young age, argue with publishers. She just was she, she, from a very young age, she was committed to what she wanted to write and knew and had instincts about that kind of storytelling. And I, I gained a lot of uh, respect for that. I mean, I think she, in terms of, in terms of how she represented uh, people, dialogue, conversations, I mean, she would, took no prisoner. She was a total realist. Mark described her as a modernist. And uh, some of these things she can get in trouble for because she, because of the way she represents and makes jokes. Uh, but she, uh, in in terms of um, being a hillbilly Thomas, I mean, let let's Mark explain it. That's where that's the other side of understand her humor and uh, sense of the grotesque and the and violence. Uh, yeah, I. Well, I would say that I think people are drawn to her because she is at the top of her craft. I would say that first. And her craft is about the fact that she thinks that good craft, good art, uh, says something about what it means to adequately be human. And she has this 2,000-year tradition that kind of gets marked by certain, you know, big names, you know, Augustine or Thomas Aquinas but really the, the, the Catholic kind of intellectual fervor of the 19th and 20th century, she's just, she's chewing on existentialism and Heidegger and the, and the French writers. She's reading uh, Marit, Jacques Maritain uh, and, 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 and consuming the kinds of ways in which Thomism is being reimagined for a kind of a modernist moment. How can, how can this wonderful intellectual and, 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 and really historical tradition help us be Catholic and modern at the same time. So this is what really what this kind of Thomist, neo-Thomism did. And what O'Connor was able to do was, was see that that's really an existential question of all art. Is, is this, an, does this adequately represent the complexities, the illusions of our, that, and delusions that we have about life? Does it, does it shake us up to see a, a more cosmic horizon? And so, especially after World War II, I think, Thomism would be kind of a, a, a way to kind of look at the world. Uh, we've, we've had the trauma of, of the Holocaust, the trauma of, of millions and millions of deaths. Uh, we thought we were all getting better, and yet we're not. I mean, Flannery O'Connor basically says, you know, we're, we're always going to be imperfect. We can never be perfected. And her stories kind of create these moments in it. So I think why are people drawn to her? Why are artists? They're, they, they get it. She adequately speaks to something that's deeply, deeply human, in the human heart and the human uh, head. And uh, she has this amazing way of staying steady, as, as Elizabeth said, staying focused, staying um, directly in front of this thing. Or what Mary Gordon says in our film, she shines the light in, in, in the darkness of the human experience. Um, and she makes us laugh at it. She makes us shocked by it. Um, but she also leaves us that kind of that moment of a kind of a surplus, a surplus of feeling that there's something greater going on here. So whether you're a singer, whether you're a painter, whether you're, um, whether you're a novelist or a poet, you're drawn to somebody who knows how to talk about what it means to be human. Yeah. And she's writing about Kafka in her prayer journal in graduate yeah. school. I mean, this is where, if you asked about what we learned, I became really impressed by just how knowledgeable she was about uh, philosophy and literature and international literature. And 
and she's she did not want to be a regional writer, southern writer, um, woman writer, and she's not at all. I mean, she is very much an international, a writer with international scope and wondering at this young age, I mean, as she's living through World War II and the horrors around World War II, wondering um, about, um, wondering about these, these Kafka-esque moments and how, how that existential challenge, what that means for religion. And that's a very sophisticated modernist thought to have at her age. And I think also it's, and I, and I guess this is really one of the important roles of, of, of any good artist is to take those uh, you know, deep, profound thoughts and, and how do you make that accessible? And I guess story is a great way to do that. And she did it so well that she she really was such a deep thinker. And as you said, she was plugged into so many of the uh, the, the philosophical conversations, the theological conversations, not only of her day but of you know the previous two thousand years. And she was able to really distill it into a way uh, through her stories that that made it accessible to a much wider audience. I mean, we could talk later on about specific examples, but I mean, the ending of Revelation is you know an eschatological you know. Uh, thesis almost of sorts, but it's in a way that, you know, even someone who does not have all that training can understand very complex thoughts in a way that's very compelling. Um, yes, yeah, she's, she's, she mentioned, I mean, Revelation, she, it's the purgatorial sense that we have to be purged of something. She's, she's reading St. Catherine of Genoa at this time, this huge thick book on purgatory. Um, and she makes a story that, that basically uses all the kinds of the backdrop of what 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 a, what a Christians believe about a purging of of the soul, this purging of everything, and it's done it really as a as a way to talk about race, class in in the South. So, putting those two things together, wow, amazing. Yeah, they're almost modern parables of sorts. I mean, they're really they're taking the the stuff that people knew around them and 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 having these very deep conversations. Um, another. Catholic author that uh, one of my favorites, J.R. Tolkien, a very different type of writer, uh, uh, was not a fan himself of literary biographies. Uh, and he was speaking specifically of written biographies uh, because what he felt was that often in, in writing these biographies, they, they get so caught up in what he called the insignificant facts, usually the more salacious or controversial things that they don't really address or, or get to the heart of the deeper truth of the person or the artist. Uh, he used an example of that, um, you know, Beethoven may have uh, cheated his publisher, but that really has nothing to do with the grandeur of his music. Right. Um, so as you were sort of sketching out and, and trying to create this roadmap for how you would explore Flannery, her writings, her legacy, how did you approach telling the story of Flannery uh, and and try to sort of uh, sift what you you know what you would want to talk about as opposed to what you felt were an insignificant facts. Well, let me go first because because Elizabeth's going to speak most of this. Obviously, the the what I said to Elizabeth, we have to tell her story because she's got an interesting life, right? She dies at thirteen. We have to tell the story in terms of her being a Catholic, uh, being a, a woman in a man's world of publishing, uh, a Southerner and a woman uh, suffering from lupus. And then I said, okay, okay, Elizabeth, now do it. <laughs> Which, Valjean could tell you a little bit about how difficult that was. Well, David, and in terms of what you asked, I really, I don't respond to literary biographies that, or films, I'm gonna keep it in the film category, that don't include some of the author's writing. I mean, I think the author's writing and in the case of Flannery O'Connor too, seeing that juxtaposition of, okay, here's the person, she was uh, shy, conservative, she went to mass every morning and really she stayed in her room and wrote. <laughs> That's what she did. Um, but let's see what she was thinking and what she was uh, writing about. So from the very beginning, and we were fortunate to have the first rights to adapt both her life story uh, as well as make use of uh, her short stories. Um, and so that's that's part of what started including and uh, illustrating uh, several of her short stories. And the second part is uh, there's not much footage of O'Connor. There's some photographs, not a whole lot, 
that get reproduced over and over. And then there's one short interview of her that's that's in the documentary and that's it. So we really had to be creative about, all right, if we want to make a feature, what are we going to look at <laughs> this entire time since we did not have a lot of archival footage to draw from. So that's where, because O'Connor was uh, a cartoonist and painted throughout her life, doing, hiring, um, we had three great female animators and a uh, male friend who did motion graphics with the animation. Uh, hiring um, these animators made a lot of sense and they all totally fell in love with Flannery O'Connor if they didn't know her already and um, did, did the work in the film. Yeah, the, the animation, I'm glad you brought that up because it adds so much to this, you know, her very compelling story, but they're all very distinct styles of animation, but at the same time, they work so well together to, to you know, in the, in the finished product. Um, in her essay, I believe it was The Novelist and the Believer, uh, she writes that the Catholic novelist doesn't have to be a saint, doesn't even have to be Catholic, but does unfortunately need to be a novelist. <laughs> So we've touched on this a little bit, but what in your estimation, specifically just from the craft of writing, makes Flannery O'Connor such a good novelist or short story writer? Um, okay, I, I'll go first on that. Um, I, think, I think first of all, uh, she, 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 she writes that after really um, standing on the shoulders of uh, Jacques Maritain's uh, art and scholasticism, where he says, listen, if you want to be if you want to be a good writer, be a good writer. If you want to be a good Christian, be a good Christian. These two things are not going to fold into each other as a kind of like um, a pedantic or kind of um, devotional thing. Art is, itself is its own knowledge. So give yourself over to the to the knowledge of your craft. So I say that because I think O'Connor spent, if you read her uh, journals, she's struggling with what kind of writer does she want to be, right? In the, in the prayer journal, and in uh, 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 meta, uh, metaphysics, uh, mathematics rather, um, she says, you know, basically make me a good writer and by good writer, doing it for the right reasons. And so she really is aware that it's her, her ego cannot get in the way. And so one of the things I love about O'Connor's writing is the way that she is so present in the sense that she's dramatizing all this narrowness, but at the same time, she's, she's not, she's not. She's got this ability to let the story tell itself, to go where the story goes. This is really true of her short stories, but even of her novels. So I think what she, what she said to be a good novelist, work your craft. Be someone who understands and gets help. Her work with Caroline Gordon, the great Catholic critic, you know, convert. Um, get, get advice. Um, try to give a concrete particular story that can have universal significance. Um, and so that idea of always finding the concrete particularity of life, especially for her, for her that meant the incarnation, that meant, you know, that meant Jesus Christ, who could in his very being hold together my concrete existence because of, of humanity and the existence of the divine. So for her, all art is a sacramental experience, a sacramental imagination. And, and artists are drawn to that because art is sacramental. And so I think that that's why she's such a great artist. So being Catholic was, 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 was obviously part of her life, but for her, um, it was about a, a fact that be a good Catholic and you'll be a good artist. But the two of these things are not kind of like woven that way. They're kind of supporting each other. Yeah, I think she, I think she said at one point that art only transcends its limitations when it stays within them, mm -hmm. and I think she was trying to stay within it, and then hopefully, uh, you know, it would it would speak on a much deeper level. Um, one of the things I, I also I mean, there's lots of things I love about the film, but it doesn't sidestep um, the complexities of Flannery O'Connor's life and writings. Um, you know, including even things that might be uncomfortable, even problematic uh, about them, inc including her treatment of, of race in both her, obviously her public and her private writings. Um, and that has obviously come to the fore in, in recent months. Um, and uh, most notably um, was because of a, a high profile article in the New Yorker. Uh, and then there was um, a, uh, a controversy to Catholic co uh, college where her name was taken off one of the campus buildings. Um, 
obviously she has her passionate defenders and her passionate critics. Um, you know, having dived so deeply into her life and spent, you know, so accompanied her through her writings in the process of this film. Um, what are your thoughts about, you know, her legacy in light of the present moment we're in? Well, I think reading her work makes a lot of sense right now. And, and knowing Flannery O'Connor's uh, personality, the way we've gotten to know it, uh, I don't think she would be too concerned about these other things being said about her. Um, if you read her fiction and read her letters uh, more closely, perhaps you really get a sense of uh, what her commitment was. I mean, starting at Iowa, she was talking to her priest and this is the biographer Brad Gooch is in our film. She was talking to her priest about writing about race and sex and being concerned about these issues. But from the very beginning, she was focused on this tension uh, between in, in the South uh, around race, um, around sex, around disability and around religion. And she, I won't say she prioritized one over the other, but let's just say from the very beginning, she was thinking through these issues of race. Uh, so, I mean, O'Connor, her work is so strong and so good that it will outlive any other concerns. And the people, uh, certainly how we approached from a documentary point of view, uh, we let, we tried to let the work speak for itself, including her personal letters. Yeah, if I, I, I would, I, I totally agree with Elizabeth. And I, I would only add that um, to, to be teaching Flannery O'Connor right now in a, in a, um, in the context of today, the 20th century, even when we were doing our film, Black Lives Matter kind of, you know, rages upon the the, the, the cultural moment uh, while we're still putting it together. There's, there was a sense that um, O'Connor is so very, very important to the conversation on race today. She is a, uh, she's somebody who was having to learn and to become awoke herself to the kinds of white privilege and assumptions of what it meant to be a white person in the South. Uh, her stories continually kind of in interrogate that, that assumption that she herself knew she lived, sometimes you know, with, with great consciousness, sometimes completely unconsciously. So I think that her stories are great because they, re they actually lead us to, especially people who, uh, who are, are white, right? Who live with that sense of a, a privilege to remember the fact that this is part of, of, of their reality, that they, they, we assume too much and that our assumptions actually hurt others. So I think that in some ways, O'Connor is part of our, our conversation today. Uh, I think, it was a, I think the, that article was unfortunate only because it, it didn't kind of, it couldn't really give a, a, a deep uh, and, I, and I think ultimately accurate perspective on it. Um, it raised some issues, but I think that if you read Flannery, as, as Elizabeth says, if you get into Flannery O'Connor and you read and you go through her letters, you see a, the journey of someone learning how not to be racist, the journey of someone how using art to uh, interrogate herself in, in, in an artistic, imaginative way, uh, what that would look like, especially for the, in the properties of her own experience, which was deeply, you know, deep South, uh, Jim Crow South still kind of just being dismantled. And so she's playing with those things and trying to come again to that question: What is the what is the most human response to this? Which for her is is a, is a, is a response that ultimately is um, focused on faith. Yeah, and we're certainly going to get to that next uh, because I, I think that is such a an important part of who she was. Um, but I remember again in one of the companion videos, I, I believe it was Richard Rodriguez who said that you know she wasn't really concerned about good and bad. She was really focused on salvation, even at her own. She was trying to work out through her writing, you know, salvation of others, but even her own salvation, she was wrestling with that. And it, it reminded me of, uh, I believe it was Solzhenitsyn who said that the line between good and evil runs right through the heart of every person. Mm -hmm. And I think she was really trying to struggle with that in her writings. And as you said, uh, when you read her, you, you see that uh, inner struggle through through her written word. Um, okay, so let's you know going back to what Tolkien had said about insignificant facts. The end of that of that quote also talks about 
that there are significant facts. And, and he said the significant fact in his writing uh, was the fact that he was a believer and specifically Catholic. You could say the same thing about Flannery O'Connor. Um, and uh, T.S. Eliot had, had written once about Dante saying, you cannot afford to ignore his, Dante's, philosophical and theological belief or skip over those passages which express them most clearly, even if you do not believe them yourself. So can we truly understand Flannery O'Connor, her writing, who she was, without understanding Flannery O'Connor, the Catholic, again, even if we don't necessarily share those beliefs? And what, you know, people at, at an art center, people ask us all the time, you know, what, how do you define Catholic art? What makes Catholic art? And it's, it's really one of the central questions that we wrestle with all the time. So I'll turn it to you and say, you know, what makes Flannery O'Connor a Catholic novelist? Because I know she might have bristled at that notion herself. Um, what, in your estimation, made her a Catholic writer? I think I'd say, first of all, just to give, uh, one of the things that was really great about working on the film is that Elizabeth, uh, my colleague, uh, is not Catholic. And so the conversations about how to, how to portray and how to narrate how important Catholicism was, was always done with this dialogue with Elizabeth, who was always trying to say, what, how can we get, uh, how can we get the most understanding of this for the largest audience? A Catholic and a non-Catholic audience. So I, you know, kudos to Elizabeth to kind of make sure that we play, we, we we focused on it, but but she brought her own uh, uh, perspectives and her sense of you know being a Christian, uh, raised Christian but not Catholic to the to the conversation. So that being said, um, I would say that to to understand Flannery O'Connor without without understanding her Catholic faith is to understand her as an existentialist. Uh, an existentialist writer uh, who seems a little bit more snarky, a little bit more, um, um, uh, a little bit more um, depressing, a little bit more difficult and hard, because it, it's actually uh, it's she she it's her faith, it's her Catholic faith that kind of was the aesthetic strategy, you might say, for all the violence, for all the grotesquerie. It was there to kind of shake up and kind of open a new way of seeing the, the moment in the story, the insight into the character, uh, or the reader's own kind of visceral experience. So um, I think that, that her Catholicism is the most humanizing thing, to be honest with you, for me, because otherwise she's just an existentialist, which is okay, right? She is interested in, in being in the existence of the human person. Um, but she sees that as a, as a as a religious experience. She sees that as ultimately a religious journey. Uh, she sees this as a journey into suffering, understanding suffering, uh, and, a, and, a, and a kind of a purging of all of those assumptions that make us proud and make us think that we're, we're better than anybody else um, and really shake us up. So I think one of my students once said, you know, uh, I think if you didn't, have, you had no clue that Flannery O'Connor was Catholic, you didn't know anything about Catholicism, you could enjoy her stories. But it's like it's like only having the whipped cream uh, of a um, of a banana split. I think that was his metaphor. That you miss the banana, the ice cream, and everything else that goes with it, because there's something underneath all that uh, that's kind of making that that whipped cream so tasty. So I kind of like to use that metaphor sometimes when I'm talking to people about why why Catholicism I think is an important uh, foundation to it. I, 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 maybe Elizabeth has a different perspective, but she really helped to to make sure that we balance that out with. How do we have the largest community understanding this tradition in her work? Well, yes, I actually was raised Presbyterian. I have a sister who's a Presbyterian minister. I have another sister who's, a, who's Catholic and is married to Alan Tate's son. So my family has a lot of really interesting conversations uh, about Protestants and Catholics around the table. Plus, we have some Jewish genetic history, too. So. Um, you know, from the beginning, my family has been very interested in sort of theological kinds of history, as well as great storytelling and writing novels and, and literature. So, yeah, I don't know that I, I always will fight a bit uh, sort of the, the claiming of the Catholic literary heritage is really you get her better if you're a Catholic. And I'll always kind of reject that. <laughs> so this is the tension. This is the creative tension that Mark and I have, right? 
that uh, I think she absolutely is uh, a great writer who uh, was interested in Judaism as, as well as anti-Semitism. And, um, you know, she, she knew those tensions because as we we're describing a little about, about racist comments and, or things she had made, including an anti-Semitic comment when she was 17, she was able to write and think about these things because she understood those emotions. And, and finally, yes, I think we all come together from whatever religious background around this compelling storytelling that um, for me is, um, is, you know, humanities based and, um, and universal. If I may, I, I would just say that for so O'Connor, I would say she would she would say that she's a Christian humanist, right? She believes, and that's I think coming all the way back to um, to Thomas Aquinas and the hillbilly Thomism of her experience is that um, it's about a, a Christian anthropology. What what does it mean to be a human being in relationship to God? I think that's her ultimate question every day. She gets to the to her typewriter for her entire life. What's the ultimate relationship? And sometimes it's farcical, it's, it's comical, sometimes it's hard, uh, but there is a sense that uh, when you can be shaken out of all of the assumptions that you have about your life, uh, grace comes in uh, sometimes with, uh, with, with fire, sometimes with a gun, sometimes with a drowning in a river, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, grace will come in the most surprising places. So I do think it, I do think she really has a Christian anthropology about her uh, that that creates it, and that and that that can that can walk along with 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 most humanism. Yeah. Well, I mean, you brought up the word grace, and that seems to be the thread that goes through all her writings. That uh, I think she had said that one of her themes was grace and the rejection of it. I mean, the usual rejection, and but grace constantly trying to break through. Um, you know, hearing you both speak, and, and I agree actually with both of you. I mean, obviously, I think Flannery O'Connor uh, can be uh, appreciated, enjoyed just by by anyone, and obviously, it it shows that she has fans. You know, she has admirers of all different backgrounds. Um, I, I would think that it's it's not that we can't appreciate. I mean, we might not be able to get all the nuances unless you have a, a, an understanding of of her Catholic faith. But I think it does reveal something about her as a writer. Um, we, it reminds me of one uh, speaker that we had here at the Sheen Center. She was an art historian, and she started out as, as a non-believer, but she was just in love with uh, Renaissance Catholic devotional paintings from the Renaissance. And she said, as she started studying them, she started studying them as a historian first, and, and she saw how magnificent they were and appreciated them. And then she, she started asking herself a question because she said the painters became her friends, uh, even though they had been dead for centuries. And she said, well, what happens if my friends actually believed what they were painting? It just, it helped her see their paintings through their eyes. Not that you couldn't appreciate them without that. It just added a different, I guess, perspective on those paintings. Um, now, speaking about perspective, I think that's where both the writer and the filmmaker, uh, you know, share their, their tools are different, but their approach is somewhat similar. Uh, you know, many people have commented on Flannery O'Connor you know, uh, her fascination with whether it's violence or the, the grotesque. Um, and, um, you know, I, one, I, I love how she says that it's, it's not an artist's job to, uh, uh, paraphrasing slightly here, to tidy up a messy world. It's just to, you know, write honestly and truthfully what you see. You know, she said her beliefs might be the light by which she sees things, but right. that doesn't change what she sees. She still sees what she sees. So as a filmmaker um, who, who dealt with all sorts of subject matters, um, did you take anything away or learn anything from Flannery O'Connor about uh, trying to just, through when you aim your camera's lens, just to try to be as truthful as possible and not try to uh, shade it in the way that you would like to portray something? All the time. <laughs> I, I think... Certainly, I think, and Elizabeth can speak to it more. Um, I think uh, when, especially this summer, we we really had to go through our film and say we tried to deal with with racism and the and the dismantling of the Jim Crow South and O'Connor's place in that is with as honest honestly as we possibly could. We tried to uh, give everyone this opportunity to go on this journey with us the way we saw it. 
Um, so I think that was one area where um, there was a real sense that we were committed to, 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 be, to, to be as honest and clear eyed uh, from the very first moment uh, of starting the film. Elizabeth? Well, we wouldn't be on American Masters if we didn't have some journalistic integrity. So, yeah. I, yeah, from the very beginning, because I've made documentary films for, you know, over a couple of decades now, it's absolutely you are looking for every side of the story and and trying to investigate uh, the best and the worst of your subject uh, according to the materials that are available to you. So this is why it took a long time. And I, as the non-O'Connor scholar, you know, threw myself into reading and researching and trying to talk to people who, you know, we, you can't make a PR piece. You make a PR piece, it's not going to be on PBS. That's not a documentary. So absolutely, we, we really, from the questions of, of race or anti-Semitism or whatever, you know, if I was not comfortable with it, if I hadn't read all these letters where she's talking about integration, where she's writing about, she's supporting Catholic priests who are on the front lines uh, during the civil civil rights uh, protests in the 1960s. If I really thought the comments she made about James Baldwin were not because she couldn't really deal with his TV persona in 1964, which was her problem, she understood he was a good writer. If I thought it was because she was deep down racist, I would not have made the film, right? I threw myself into the research and went over and over the letters. And sure, there are some questions. We put them in the film because you can't 100% answer anything or know what was in someone's head. So that's up to the viewer to finally decide. Uh, but absolutely, as Mark knows, I obsessed and, and went through every single um, uh, bit of material I could. And we had to, with the NEH, you have to have outside advisors who document and confirm. Um, and then PBS, also your journalistic integrity. Well, part of the challenge, I would assume, because you said you were so limited to the actual recordings of her, uh, was when you have someone who communicated to the world through written words, uh, and you wanting to bring her voice to life, you needed to find someone to do that. And you found someone uh, who did that extremely well uh, with Mary Steenburgen, uh, providing the voice of, of Flannery O'Connor in the film. Can you talk a little bit about um, that experience? Was she, did she, was she familiar with um, Flannery's writings? Uh, you know, what was that process like? Well, I wrote her a heartfelt letter. <laughs> I mean, I love her work. Mark also loved her work and I'm from Florida and she had uh, done a film on the writer Marjorie Kennan Rawlings. And so she'd already done something about a writer and that's part of what um, attracted me to her. And then yes, absolutely, um, she knew O'Connor's work and uh, she, was, she was impressed with our rough cut. So it was, it was great. She was very generous and um, I, she's such a talent, right? One take and she, she nailed the, the lines we had give her barely needed any direction. Yeah, it was, she was, she really was a delight. Um, at one point, my favorite story, and I don't think she'd be upset. You know, she's got a beautiful, beautiful, sultry voice. And one time she was reading a line though. And I said, oh my gosh, that's too sultry for Flannery O'Connor. And she was like, oh, you're right. You know, so she was, <laughs> so it was just wonderful though, but such, such a pro and so talented and really, really gave of her time. I mean, it was just incredible. One of the things I, I think Elizabeth and I both realized is that artists so love Flannery O'Connor that they opened their doors for interviews and to help us. They were interested in learning about her. Um, they were interested in becoming part of this uh, this program, this, this project that we did. Um, and Mary was one of those. Mary Steenburgen was one of those. Well, that certainly comes across. I mean, everyone you interview seems so passionate about her. So while I'm sure it took an enormous amount of work to track everyone down when you were able to get to them, it seemed like they were very willing to, to talk about Flannery O'Connor. Um, you know, this is one of those, I guess she, she's so prolific and there's so many stories to choose from in addition to her other writings, her letters, her essays. Um, but if you had to pick one piece, do you have a favorite piece of writing? I mean, doing a little bit uh, of, you know, rereading some of her stuff, I, I again was drawn to her. Her prayer journal is so, not only is it beautiful, it's just so honest. You know, at one point she says, 
that you know she's in the way and she asked God to help push herself aside. Um, what what were some of if you could pick favorite writings from Flannery? What would they be? It, it, it depends on the interview and it depends on the day of the week. I mean, I'm I'm such a fan, and I was just rereading her prayer journal also, and and the the sense because we were doing a biography, I love the sense of um, of uh, curiosity and her concern about her ego. Uh, yeah, I think the prayer journal and the habit of being her personal letters. So her I, her nonfiction her essays and mystery manners, um, her short stories are so fabulous. Uh, let's see, for this interview, I'm gonna say the displaced person. <laughs> okay. How about you, Father? Well, you know, um, I'm, so I'm teaching all of Flannery O'Connor uh, to some students right now. Uh, so we're all the, the habit of being, the mystery and manners, uh, the, the two sh clusters of short stories and the two novels. Um, I have to say that I, uh, I'm reading right now the, the novel that we really didn't have time to talk about, The Violent Bear Away, and I read it over the weekend again for like the 20th time, and how compelling and how brilliant the, 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 the novel is. We spent a lot of time with uh, Wise Blood um, uh, because we had, of course, the great footage from John Huston's film, and we can kind of explore that where, where uh, there's not been as much uh, film or, or conversation about the other novel. But The Violent Bear Away is an amazing novel, uh, and I, I just, again, I was kind of blown away by, by how, how well crafted and how it stayed with me and made me think. Um, if I had to say a short story, which is kind of what she's going to always, I think she's always going to be known for, I, I would say right now, uh, we just finished Good Country People, and uh, I had such a good time with that story, uh, with Hold the Joy, Hope Well. Um, so that, that, right now, that's the one I would, I would say is, is just extraordinary. Well, we, uh, you know, want to keep a track of time here. If I could maybe just get in a couple more quick questions. Um, do you, there's a quote I came across in one of her essays, Father, and be curious in, in getting your take on this. Um, I believe it's from Novelist and the Believer, and let me just read it and then just see what your thoughts would be on it. Uh, she's, she's talking about, um, I guess, being a, an author who's also a believer uh, and, and, the, the, the relationship to, to modernity. Uh, and she says, I don't believe that we shall have great religious fiction again until we have that happy combination of believing artists and believing society. Until that time, novelists will have to do the best they can uh, with the world they have. Um, it, it's, it may find in the end that instead of reflecting the image at the heart of things, uh, he has only reflected. Uh, uh, he can only ref uh, reflect our broken condition, um, and this may be a modest achievement, but perhaps a necessary one. Uh, can, what do you think about that? That maybe uh, in in a in a culture that I guess would not be wrong to classify as secular, that maybe for someone who wants to be a uh, artist of faith, that really the best contribution they can do is is just to write about the 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 mystery of, of the broken human condition. Yeah, I, I, she does that beautifully, right? And um, and she would say that it's really, it's it's, it's the, the non-believers, the person who thinks God is dead, that is her audience. That's who she thinks she's writing for. Uh, and so there's a, there's a bit of a vocation to call them into the mystery of their own life, to call into question the, the, the reductionisms of the, everyone, religious or not, uh, kind of uh, live and um, and move in their life uh, around. She, so she really does want to kind of, um, I think her aesthetic strategy is to shake us up, to make us see, to make us hear, uh, so that we can be, as you mentioned in the prayer journal, a little more displaced. If you talk about, you know, when Elizabeth said that was her favorite story, I mean, she thinks that there's a kind of, you know, an original displacement, even Jesus Christ is displaced, comes to become human. There is a sense that that's kind of the, the existential reality and stop ignoring it. Stop trying to, you know, uh, inebriate yourself to it. Stop trying to run from it. You are a sinner yet loved. You are somebody who's broken, but can be 
with others in that brokenness. You can have compassion. So I, I think O'Connor's whole aesthetic as a, as a Catholic writer is to say, if, if most of the people don't really take the incarnation or the redemption seriously, um, how do I tell stories in which um, redemption and a sense of my particular life um, gets gets told in such a profoundly dramatic, quick, almost short story kind of parable-like way? Yeah, I think she says that, uh, you know, we don't, the world today doesn't have, I think it was her quote, that uh, does not have a sharp eye for the almost imperceptible intrusions of grace. And I think that's what she was trying to do, that idea of grace constantly working. Um, well, uh, Elizabeth, you know, you've spent so much time creating this amazing film about, about Flannery O'Connor. Uh, as you were in this process, you know, knowing, uh, Flannery had such strong thoughts on, on almost every subject. And when you read her letters, she just has an opinion about everything. Did you ever think what her opinion would be about somebody making a film about her? Do you think she would find, you think she would be amused by that or? I think she would hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I think she would be too. Yeah, but I, I mean, she, you know, she had this ironic relationship to pop culture, to television. And, you know, I'm constant, I'm always conscious of the fact that, hey, our film did well in part because we had a great life story and great fiction to deal with. She is the reason the film did well. And I, I have not lost, lost sight of that. Um, and I, I wanted to add, David, to your last comment and question, what you're talking about with her uh, in terms of how her stories and her life story address and her faith, you know, the broken human being, uh, Angela O'Donnell says this in our film too, the brokenness of, in her story, Temple of the Holy Ghost, um, of, a, of an intersex, of a hermaphrodite, of this, of this figure where gender is a question. And, and that's why she's so, she's so relevant today. And, and I, th I think this dealing with the questions of so-called brokenness and how she, in her own life, with her own experiences of disability, I mean, really, she she helped me develop a closer relationship to God because of of her examination in her fiction. I think. Wow, wow. I, well, we could. I mean, she's such a rich topic. We could spend many, many, many hours talking about her. Um, but I guess for the final question, you know, probably one of her best known lines uh, is that. Uh, you know, for the hard of hearing, you have to shout, and for the you know the blind, you have to draw large, startling figures. What do you hope uh, this film shouts to a world that, in many ways, is hard of hearing? Yeah, um, I think uh, David. I think I, I hope the film says that uh, that art is a way to understand who you are. An old-fashioned idea that art represents gives us ways to think about uh to go on a journey uh in our interior life and with others and that her art does it probably better than than most um that her art can cause you to convert your life to christ or to something else but but you know there's very few artists maybe five or six where you read and say i might have to i might have to change my life because of this i know i've met people who've said that i think elizabeth has too um so I, th I want people to be able to read her and say, oh, she's important. She says something about our human condition that I, I don't want to miss. Yeah, part of my goal was always to have her name right up there with Faulkner's when you're talking about uh, <laughs> great writers. And and then to go beyond that, Dostoevsky, why not? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I absolutely, I think she is a writer for today. I think her life story, including sort of cancel culture and how she got called out in disingenuous ways for being racist. Um, her work will outlive that. Um, I mean, I, I, I think she, it becomes its own kind of documentary story that sort of the release of the film and the story around the film and what's happening today uh, just makes her even more, more, her life story more relevant. So I, I think she would, and I hope dearly that she would appreciate uh, how seriously it's being taken. Oh, well, you know, her, her, the word that keeps coming up in her prayer journal is gratitude. Yeah. So um, that word also 
has come up, as I think, and I've shared this last hour with you. Uh, just gratitude to the both of you for spending this time with us. Gratitude for sharing this wonderful film with us. So um, I just want to, uh, again, thank you um, and uh, wish you all the best on your ongoing ministry of filmmaking. Um, and again, uh, to our, our viewers, if you have not seen it yet, um, this film is available on our website through October 15th, and it will be airing uh, early next year on PBS American Masters, hopefully, I believe you said sometime maybe during uh, Women's History Month. Um, but I guess we'll, you know, we'll keep checking our local listings for that. Um, and also thank you to our viewers. Um, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as we enjoyed uh, bringing it to you. Again, uh, we ask that you like us, uh, that you subscribe to our Sheen Talks YouTube channel, uh, and that you go ahead and click that bell icon for future updates. Uh, again, during these challenging uh, and critical times, we do ask that you consider making a uh, donation to the Sheen Center. Uh, no gift, no matter how small, is uh, unappreciated. Uh, every gift makes a big difference. And again, we're happy to announce that uh, part of our donations from now through Thanksgiving uh, will be shared with the food banks of Catholic Charities. Uh, until next time, stay safe, be well, God bless.